Hello, writers. Come write with me. My name is Michaela Greenwood. I create worlds for mind adventures. Welcome to my channel, Write with Michaela. Don't forget to like and subscribe and hit the bell so you can go on this journey with me. Today, we are going to discuss a few tools and then a few terms. The tools we are going to discuss are compare and contrast. Now, in Season 1, Episode 27, we discussed metaphors and similes. In that episode, we defined both of those terms, uh, both of those things as methods to compare things. So we will use some of that here today. Now, why would you want to compare or contrast things? Well, when you have readers... You can't just say, oh, this is soft here. Feel it. Especially not if you have created a different world. So how soft or hard or rough or smooth or whatever is the thing that you are describing in your story. When we are writing a story, we want our readers or our listeners to, of our audiobooks to get the full experience. We want them to be able to immerse themselves in the world we created. To do that, we have to compare or contrast. It, it's as soft as a silk shirt. That's a comparison. Or it's as soft as a fluffy pillow. Now I'm talking about a different type of soft. But you get the idea. What if we wanted the height? It's as tall as a three-story building. Now, I have to caution you to remember your setting. If your time period doesn't have silk and pillows, you can't use that. If your time period doesn't have three-story buildings, you can't use that. And that setting was very important, so we had to keep in alignment with that setting. So, in writing your stories, you want to use elements that are similar while comparing and elements that are different while contrasting. And you want to use elements in the time period of your setting. Note that contrasting doesn't necessarily mean to use antonyms or opposites. It's just, it, it is just difference. You, you could say hot and cold and compare it that way with using antonyms or to contrast that way. But... Contrasting doesn't mean you have to have an antonym. That stool has three legs. This stool has four. That's a contrasting thing. So, it doesn't have to be hot and cold and stuff like that. Some terms we use to compare would be like, similar to, also, Similarly, in the same way, likewise, compared to, or in like manner. Some words to contrast things would be unlike, in contrast, contrasted with, on the contrary, however, although, yet, even though, nevertheless, conversely, <clears throat> on the other hand, I'm sure you can think of more words for each thing. So I'm not going to keep going with that. This gives you an idea that sometimes somebody says, however, and they're contrasting. You may not have thought of that as being a contrasting thing, that they were contrasting things. But it, it can be used that way. So it's just kind of opening our eyes to what we're already doing, what we're already seeing, what we're already hearing. Now, we've been adding to our cave stories. And the second time we added, I described the beast in the cave. Now, I have taken a snippet of that, and I'm going to read it so we can look at compare and contrast. Or more, I think it's more compare, but let's do that. So this was season two, episode 15. And this was in first person when I wrote this. Later, I changed it. From first person to third person. Okay, I'm going to read that snippet. Then a huge creature, perhaps the size of a bear, fills the archway from 
over there and it bounds across the chamber to a, the squealing animal. I press against the wall and slip slightly into the tunnel. I don't know how this creature senses things, but it is fast and the small animal is dead. My heart is beating so fast now that I'm sure no machine could measure how many beats per minute. I pull my knife and open the blade. It is a medium-sized knife, pocket knife, but for the beast, it would be small and probably won't do me much good. I stay as still as possible while the creature devours the small animal. So if you've been following me, you probably remember some of that scene or you remember that scene. Now, the first comparative thing that I want us to look at is the huge creature is the size of a bear. Now, in life, there are many types of bears and many sizes. Surely a grizzly bear is bigger than a black bear. But the reader or listener gets the idea that the creature is huge, but not dinosaur size. It's a big creature, but it's not necessarily, you know, the size of a house or something like that, like a dinosaur might be. So it gives you the comparison so that you have an, a rough idea of, of that. The next comparative item is my heart is beating so fast now that I'm sure no machine could measure how many beats per minute. While we don't know exactly a time period or the setting for this, we can assume it is close to our time. They do have technology. They've talked about some cameras and dro drones and stuff that we have in today's time. So you can assume that it is close to our time. And the machines we use to measure heart rate can measure a pretty fast rate. So this gives the idea, gives the reader an idea of how very, very fast while using a little hyperbole as well. Do you remember hyperbole? That was a long time ago too. Hyperbole, hyperbole, blah, I can't even say the word now. Hyperbole uses an exaggeration to make a specific point or to add emphasis. So I've made a comparison to how fast a machine could measure, but there is also some exaggeration going on in that scene. And that, and that kind of shows you how we use all of these tools to put these things together. So the final comparison we will look at from this snippet is the medium-sized pocket knife is small for the beast. My readers probably have an idea of a medium-sized pocket knife. If the reader or listener is a guy, he might think medium for a guy is different than for a woman, which is probably true. But still, he would have an idea of the size of knife <coughs> that I'm talking about. Now think about the character, whose name is now Zolira, using the knife on the creature and not doing any damage. How big does the creature have to be for that assumption or that inference? That comparison gives my readers ideas. They give them more picture things in their mind. Okay, right, let's look at Tahia. I'm not going to read a snippet, but the story I... Uh, I read Tahia in season two, and I contrasted how Bollock lit the candle and how Tahia lit the candle the first time. Well, he said the spell and lit the flame, and she had a flame jump from somewhere. Both still lit the candle, just in a different way. And then later in the story, when I described the test, my readers could imagine how Tahia tried to accomplish them, and how, in contrast, the witching community thought the person testing should accomplish the test. Also, in City of the Ancients, the story I read in Season 1, I contrasted the, the dinghy that Kirsha found to what a normal dinghy would be. Even if my readers don't know what a dinghy is supposed to look like. They can't necessarily conjure up a dinghy versus a canoe or whatever. They know that Kirsch's is not quite normal. 
Also, the story contrasted the wooden needle that she you know, puts the orb in. She wears it. They contrasted the story contrasted the wooden needle that held the orb key to a normal needle. So there's some contrast. So if if we comb through the stories and the scenes that I've read on the channel, I'm sure we would find many more incidences of both comparing and contrasting. We have, as writers, have to paint pictures with our words. And those pictures need to be as three-dimensional as possible to include all of our reader senses. And, of course, if you use hyperbole, try to make it discernible to the reader as well. Now, leave a comment below on something that a movie or show you've watched or a book you've read compares or contrasts things. It could be something simple like the alien skin was as green as the grass or the paint was as blue as the sky. So that's the simple ones. It could be epic like the explosion was as volatile as an earthquake that's a level five on the Richter scale. That's a comparison. Anything you want to compare or contrast. And as an assignment, I don't give you many of these, but this is an assignment. I want you to notice things compared or contrasted the next time you watch something, next time you read a book, or even if you're talking with friends and somebody's telling a story, you know, telling about their vacation or telling about this thing that happened. Notice when people compare things. Notice when they contrast things. Writers use these tools a lot in writing. Even even in nonfiction. Because in nonfiction, you're still trying to describe something to your readers. And you might be having to explain something that may not be something that they're familiar with. And you're a step-by-step how-to book kind of thing you would still need something to compare or contrast so that you the readers understand what you're telling them now we are going to look at the two terms comparative and superlative we use comparative adjectives to compare differences between two objects the two objects they modify so larger smaller faster higher taller bigger, softer, rougher, rougher. We look at we looked at soft earlier, so we say we said something was well, as soft as a silk shirt. Or okay, so that was the first item. It was soft as a silk shirt, but the next item was softer than the first. That means it's even softer than the silk shirt. So many of these words contain the er ending. Like we, we said softer, larger, higher, taller. So some of them have the ER ending. But some words don't have a comparative word. So you would use more in front of them. Like fun and more fun. I lost my place. I'm sorry. Expensive, more expensive, interesting and more interesting. Helpful and more helpful. Jagged and more jagged. Some irregular ones, like bad. You would not say badder or more bad. You would say worse. This one is bad. This one is worse. For the comparative of little, you would use this is little, this is less. Okay. For far... You would use farther or further. So it has two comparatives. Now, side note, farther, the one spelled with an A, is for distance. At least as I learned it, they may change, they change everything. So as I learned it, the F-A-R-T-H-E-R -E was for distance. And then further would be like, I'm thinking on that further. So you would use one or the other, but if you had distance, you would use the one with the A. So what's the superlative? We use superlative adjectives when we are comparing more than two things. 
So the imperative is two, superlative is three, four, five things. Okay, when we are comparing two things, uh, comparing more than two things to compare the differences. So largest, smallest, fastest, highest, tallest, biggest, softest, roughest, etc., etc. For those words that don't have a superlative, you would use most. So before we had more fun for fun, now we have most fun, most expensive, most interesting, most helpful, most jagged. The irregular ones I mentioned would be, we had bad, and then worse, and then worst. Least for little. So we have little, less, least. Farthest or furthest for far. So far, farther, farthest, or far, further, far, furthest. And for good, it would be best. So good, better, best. If you're not sure, don't, don't get, you know, stressed out about this. I'm just trying to bring this to your attention, to your awareness. If you're not sure, just look it up. It, it is Google will tell you, you know, I need the comparative word for this. And it will tell you. there Because there's some funny rules out there that don't always work. I, I used to teach ESL to adults. And they gave me the definition that if it was one or two syllables, you add ER. And I was like, I didn't know that rule. And... I was like, I quickly told them, funner was not a word. You don't add ER to fun. Now, certainly funny can become funnier. Also, I think there's there are examples out there of three-syllable word that uses the ER and not more as well. I don't remember that example at present. Or if there was one, I'm pretty sure there was one because I think I came up with one while I was teaching them. I don't remember, and I tried to look something up, and Google wouldn't tell me anything about that. I'm sure if I had the word, it would tell me. Just remember, such rules are aids. If you have doubts, look it up. This isn't to stress you out or anything or something. It just, you have the rules, but if you're not sure... Look it up, then you will find out if the the word follows the rules or is irregular or breaks the rules. You know, sometimes to have fun, you have to break the rules and have more fun. That's a play on words, not a suggestion. <laughs> Leave a comment on a comparative or superlative that you used recently. Like maybe you said, oh, that flavor ice cream was the most delicious one I've ever tasted. Or you, you were at a Chinese restaurant with a friend and like, oh, your Chinese dish that you ordered was better than mine. Anything that you used or heard in real life recently. And you, when you start listening for this stuff, you're going to hear that we use this kind of thing all the time. We're, we always compare things or contrast things. Now, I had mentioned the setting. So we're going to take a little bit of a gander here uh, and have a short side note. And this is funny. My husband and I were watching the movie uh, Return of the Mummy together. And the characters were talking about an oasis and serving cocktail drinks with the little umbrellas and their drinks. My husband knows my content on the channel and he follows me, which as good husbands they should, right? So we paused the movie and he asked if they had those little umbrellas in 1933, which was the date flashed up on the screen, you know, 1933. And then here they are talking about it. We looked it up. Guess what? Henry Yi, a Hilton Waikiki bartender, invented those umbrellas in 1932. So the setting was fine. My husband also commented on the look of the automobiles used in the film. Looked like they were from the 30s. 
I have to take his word on that because I have no clue. I don't know cars. But his comment points to the fact that sticking to your setting is even more important in a movie. Our readers and viewers are going to pick up on different details. So everything needs to be in sync. From the cars, to the clothes, to the hats, to the use of language. That's not to say you get everything right on your first draft. But there are things to double check when you edit. Um, and Google will kind of underline. If you put, like... Let's see. If you put more in front of one of those words up there, like more large, Google might underline it in blue, and it will suggest to you larger instead of more large. So th there are some tools out there to help you edit. So don't, don't worry about that. On that note, leave a comment on if you've seen a movie or a show or read a book where the story didn't stay true to the setting. And tell what was out of place. No criticisms on any comments. Because before we looked it up, if we, if we had just posted that comment, we hadn't looked it up. My husband and I thought the little umbrellas were out of place. We thought that maybe the 50s or something, you know, the roaring 50s. or you know, I don't know what my husband thought, but, you know, I didn't think 30s for sure. And we thought it was out of place. So somebody may post something that they thought was out of place. And maybe they looked it up later and found out it wasn't. But while they were watching the movie or reading the book or whatever, they may have thought, that, that's out of place. That's not the right setting. So leave that comment on if you found something that was out of place or you thought it was out of place. It doesn't have to be that it was exactly. So that's why there's no criticisms. What our perspectives are. Join me Friday for Eleni's Pride Breaking Point. Chapter 20, More Linkers. This is the last chapter. Join me Tuesday for a review of Season 3.1 because it will be the first episode of Season 3.2. That will be four weeks since our last Writing with a Down Soldier. And I've been doing those every four weeks. But I think I will push it one more week and give us a little break. I know you have plenty to write on. Some of you are probably still working on the story you started during NaNoWriMo in November. And maybe you have 65,000 words by now on that. So you go write on that. Also, since we aren't writing on Tuesday, you can pull out your works and read through them and edit one or more stories. It, it will still be fun. When you go back through and you edit your story, you do a read through, you're editing your story, you're like, yo, okay, that sounds good. I like that. Okay, uh, maybe I missed that. Let me put this in and add that and tie more things together. And you will see how good it is. So that's where the fun comes in. Sometimes when you're writing, you're just down in the, you know, just typing, 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 typing. Then you go back and read and you get to relax and enjoy the own, your own story. And... You know, it, it, it's fun. And then we on the channel will be covering everything that we have covered in season 3.1. And it always amazes me how much we cover in a season. And I'm just like looking at it going like, wow, that was a lot of stuff. So that, that's, uh, that, that'll be fun too. The Friday after that, I will give the plot for book two. And remember, if you just want one book, then this plot will go behind or at the end of plot 3.1. Or you can intermingle it. You're the writer. It's the way you want it to be. If you, you have done steps 1, 2, and 3 for the plot and you want to stick this next one in before you do the other points of the plot, have at it. This is your creation. And you need to share your creation. Send it to send your creations to writewithmckella at gmail.com. Now, don't forget to visit my website, bymckella.com, and read some character bios, 
send your writings and chapters, like I said, to writewithmichella at gmail.com and leave comments on your favorite characters. If you hit like and subscribe and the bell, then we will continue to write together and other people will have a higher chance of finding this video and this channel since your likes will push the video out to a greater audience. Thank you for joining me today. I really appreciate your participation. If you know someone who would like this video, then please share with them. This is Michaela with Write with Michaela. Bye for now.